So now it's my pleasure to introduce Mike O'Halloran. He is the NFIB Maryland State Director. Uh, Mike is a graduate of Salisbury University and was most recently the manager of state government affairs for the air conditioning. Um, Heating and Refrigeration Institute. Heating and Refrigeration <laughs> Institute. Uh, and that's in Arlington, Virginia. So he came up this morning with uh, no traffic. Um, and again, how long have you been with NFIB, Mike? Uh, three years. So three years. He's a great resource in Annapolis, a great resource for business. Please help me welcome Mike. Good morning, everybody. How are we all doing? Good morning. All right. Uh, well, first and foremost, I, I want to thank Paul uh, and the Chamber for inviting me up here this morning. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, today's sponsor. Uh, and speaking of which, I have actually uh, kudos to, to you guys, to uh, the Chamber members. I mean, I look at these uh, signs up here. Uh, you guys have got a great community up here. Um, you know, the, the amount of sponsors you have. Uh, for a local chamber is fantastic. I also want to acknowledge Paul again. Um, you know, I, we creatures of Annapolis, um, you know, we kind of live in a bubble, particularly for 90 days out of the year. Um, and it's really great to, uh, to see folks, uh, Paul in particular, who does an excellent job of representing not just the Washington County Chamber, uh, but I think Washington County businesses and Western Maryland businesses, quite frankly, in general. Um, you know, like I said, we, we creatures of habit, whenever we see new faces uh, come into town, we always kind of glom on them and be like, hey, what are you doing here? What's your issue? Why are you here? Uh, and Paul, believe it or not, is actually becoming a, a regular face, and I, I mean that in the best way possible. Um, because again, he's, he's coming down to Annapolis, he's taking the time to, to represent you, uh, his, uh, his constituents, and uh, I just want to acknowledge him for, for doing a fantastic job. Uh, so why are we here today? Um, we're here mostly to talk about the, uh, the minimum wage debate in Annapolis. Uh, obviously question and answers. I'll do my best to uh, fake a, uh, a, a good response to any of your questions about anything going down uh, in Annapolis this, this legislative session. Uh, so I've, I've always heard that it's always good to start off the presentation with a little bit of joke. So. I got a little cartoon here that I found uh, late last night that I added in. Um, minimum wage. Obviously, there are, there are some unintended consequences. Um, so I'd like to just briefly start with, you know, where are we? How did we get here? Uh, so in 2014, under former uh, Governor Martin O'Malley, uh, he, uh, in his final year in office, he left us with uh, a nice little parting gift by raising the, uh, the state's minimum wage. Um, so if you'll see, uh, come July 1, the state minimum wage will raise to $10.10. Well, there are some folks in Annapolis uh, who would like to move the goalposts on small businesses, quite frankly. Uh, and before the, uh, the latest minimum wage increase is even phased in, they want to go ahead and bump it up to $15. So, because we have uh, special people, I'll leave it at that. Uh, Montgomery and Prince George's counties, in all their wisdom, decided, you know what? 1010 isn't good enough for us. We're actually going to move it up a little bit higher. So they're actually, right now, they're at uh, $11.50 in Montgomery County. It's, uh, it's bifurcated. Um, actually, check that. Montgomery County, they actually already passed a $15 minimum wage. Um, and I want to draw, you know, obviously, uh, here in, in, in Washington County, I'm sure there are a lot of businesses uh, that do business in either Montgomery or Prince George's County. So I'd like to draw your attention to this right here. Just because you're located in Washington County does not mean that you are free and clear from paying that higher minimum wage. If you do business in either of those jurisdictions, you're responsible for paying that jurisdiction's minimum wage. So just uh, speaking of bookkeepers, that ought to be a nice... Uh, <laughs> a nice little uh, hurdle to jump over when you're when you're doing your books. Um, so what's everyone else doing around us? Uh, I won't bore you to death, but you can see there there are some states out there who are actually above ten dollars and ten cents. But let's, like Tip O'Neill said, all politics is local, right? So let's look at Maryland's neighbors: Delaware, Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia. I threw DC in there, but uh, DC is DC, so they're going to do what they're going to do. But you'll see 
Our competitors, they're keeping their, their the, the minimum wage low because, did this go off? Yeah, oh. you get well, backwards. I can boom, right? Okay. You guys boom. can hear me, everyone can hear me? All right. Um, you know, the competitors, are the, the bordering states, they realize uh, that there's a certain competitive uh, advantage to allowing small businesses and small employers to pay the wages, quite frankly, that they can that they can afford. So, uh, and actually, my little start on there, Maine and Rhode Island will actually raise above 1010 in the F years, but that's neither here nor there. So let's talk about the quote fight for 15. Um, you know, I, I I would be remiss if I didn't at least acknowledge you know what what the advocates and the proponents for. Uh, $15 minimum wage, uh, what they're saying, what they're doing, and how they got it started. So back in 2012, uh, some fast food workers in New York City uh, went on strike uh, for higher wages, and it just kind of caught on like wildfire. Um, and the, uh, the, the uh, behind the scenes, if you will, um, the agitators, uh, were, were the Service Employees International Union, SEIU. Uh, here in Maryland, um, the proponents are SEIU groups by the names of uh, Working Families, Moms Rising, the Job Opportunities Task Force, and Business for a Fair Minimum Wage. This last one, by the, by the way, it's, it's kind of funny. The, uh, you know, both the House and Senate committees have already heard the $15 minimum wage bill. Um, and this group came in, it's, it's a national group, um, and it's, it's kind of ironic, and I just wanted to share it with you guys. Um, the, the woman who was representing the group, she is a business owner, um, and she's saying, you know, look, uh, our organization feels that uh, $15 minimum wage is reasonable, it should be done, you know, rising tide lifts all ships, all that good stuff. Uh, the question was asked of her by a committee member, okay, ma'am, so, what do you pay your employees? She said, $13. You kind of had to stop and go, well, wait a minute, you're in here advocating $15 minimum wage, but you're paying your employees $13 an hour right now. Something, something's not adding up, right? So how do you explain that? She's like, well, I just feel that, you know, if you made it $15, then, you know, everybody would have to do it. Everybody would have to be on the same level playing field. I'm sure you guys as small business owners can uh, acknowledge the fact that that doesn't quite add up. Uh, moving right along, um, oh, here's, here's what uh, the proponents are saying about a $15 minimum wage. They're saying, you know, in the neighborhood of 570,000 workers get a raise, 270,000 children benefit from higher family income, 90% are at least 20 years old. But the thing about these numbers are they're actually deriving these numbers by just picking through and, in my opinion, kind of cherry picking what they're referring to as metadata in an unpublished survey by a, a group called the Economic Policy Institute. So, you know, with all respect to, to the proponents, and, and I'll even acknowledge that, that perhaps they have some, some good points in their arguments. Um, they're, they're using some, some funny math, quite frankly. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're just drawing conclusions, and in my opinion, it, it's kind of, it, it's baseless, right? It's not really, um, you know, acknowledging facts, statistics, et cetera. They're just kind of going through other uh, studies and saying, you know what? We're gonna extrapolate this and make it work for, for Maryland. Um, so believe it or not, uh, there's, there's legislation in Maryland, there's more than just one bill uh, with regards to minimum wage in Maryland, uh, what I'm referring to as, as the others. Uh, three bills out there, oddly enough, they're all in the Senate, and just a little inside baseball, oddly enough, the uh, main sponsors uh, have very tough primaries ahead of them. The, the, Two sponsors, Senators Robinson and McFadden, are Baltimore City Senators who have very tough primaries coming up. Uh, so again, it's an election year of politics. It is what it is. Uh, at any rate, um, these are some other bills out there. Uh, they, they really haven't garnered the, the sort of uh, media coverage uh, that this next bill has. 
so this is what I'm calling the main event. Um, in the Senate, the uh, sponsor is Senator Rich Madalino from Montgomery County, uh, who is also uh, one in the clown car of the Democratic uh, primary uh, contestants. Um, if you're not paying attention, I think there's eight or nine uh, people running for the Democratic nomination for, for governor. Senator Madalino is one of them. He is the vice chair of the Senate Budget and Taxation Committee. In the House, we have multiple lead sponsors. There's Delegate Settlement uh, from Baltimore County, Delegate Fennell from, I believe, Howard County, and Delegate Waltstriker from Montgomery County, uh, the last of which is actually running to take the place of Senator Madalino. They are in the the same legislative district. So right here you have the, uh, the particulars on the bill. Uh, $15 for all employers regardless of uh, how many employees you have at your business. Uh, if you'll remember a few slides ago, Montgomery County and even the slide before, uh, other bills by, uh, you know, uh, delineate based on the size of your business, give you a little more time to ramp up. This bill does not matter. We're all in it together. Um, and also, uh, if $15 wasn't enough, they're going to index it to inflation. There are 18 other states uh, that tie their minimum wage uh, to inflation, whether it's the Social Security Administration's COLA or CPI based on you know, the, the metropolitan area that you're close, nearby, et cetera. Um, personally, uh, you know, I think there's uh, a slight abdication of, uh, of duty, if you will, when you, when you tie the minimum wage to, uh, or, or index it to inflation. Because uh, quite frankly, you know, I think the, the minimum wage is such an important issue, whether you're for increasing it or for keeping it at a reasonable level and letting the marketplace decide, the labor market decide what you pay. Um, it's an important issue and it should be debated, vetted, amended, et cetera, et cetera, all that good stuff in the legislative process each time uh, it, it, it needs to be raised. Um, any restaurant operators out here today? Yes, no? Well, they're, they're cooking breakfast right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, so I kind of consider myself a restaurant man. I, I grew up in the restaurant industry. In fact, I always, you know, almost on a weekly basis, I ask my better half, you know, I just go back to bartending and serving. I will be the happiest man on the face of the planet. Um, but uh, the, the, the bill, uh, the, the main event bill, uh, eliminates the tip credit, which um, just to give you an idea, uh, that turns the restaurant industry on its ear. Uh, and it is not hyperbole to say that if you wanna get rid of the tip credit, you better be ready to pay for a $30 cheeseburger. Um, and it's also actually interesting, uh, many, many legislators in Annapolis do not realize how the tip credit works. Uh, right now, the, the tipped wage is $3.63. Uh, what a lot of legislators don't realize, they, they think, oh my goodness, these poor servers, they're only making $3.63 uh, an hour. You know, what if they have a bad day and they don't get a lot of tips? What they don't realize is that restaurant operators are on the hook. Let's say you're, you're a, a server, you're working the lunch shift, and you don't make a lot of tips. In fact, let's say you get a couple tables, you make $20 in tips over a, a four hour shift. Um, that restaurant operator is responsible for making up the difference of the minimum wage. So either way, that employee is whole. That employee is making, at the very least, the minimum wage. Now, a lot of servers actually hate the idea of getting rid of the tip credit. Why? Because they're making a lot more than the minimum wage. And once you get rid of the tip credit, word's going to spread and tipping as we know it will cease to exist. I'm telling you this as a restaurant man, it's the fact. I mean, it's, it's not hyperbole. Uh, and also, just interestingly enough, uh, the tip credit in the bill is eliminated over a little bit longer period. But look at that number at the, at the bottom there. By 2025, 
that wage an hour will increase $11.37. And I had to Google this last night, that's a 313% increase in eight years. So, how's it working out for you? How's this $15 minimum wage working out in other jurisdictions that have enacted it? So, in Seattle, Washington, uh, they, uh, they enacted it, a $15 minimum wage, oh uh, gosh, about four years ago, three, four years ago. Uh, and the University of Washington uh, did a study that was commissioned, by the way, by the, the Seattle, the, the city council. What did that study say? Right there. Jobs and hours actually disappeared and wages actually dropped. Study, by the way, it was done when it was at $13 an hour. They hadn't even gotten the $15 an hour when they conducted the study, and they're already seeing the negative impacts. In California, a study by the Employment Policies Institute showed that with each wage increase, there is demonstrable loss of jobs in industries with a higher percentage of minimum wage workers. So what does that last part mean? That means that small businesses, in particular, are negatively impacted by this. Why? Because small businesses are, quite frankly, where a lot of folks are either entering or re-entering the labor force. So they're getting hit hardest by these things. So what about me, right? What about, what about you as employers right here in the state of Maryland? So the impact of Senate Bill 543 and House Bill 664, uh, the NFIB Research Center uh, did a study on it. We used uh, what we call the, the BISA, uh, Business Size Impact Module, and it's based off of, uh, for, the, for uh, those of you in the know, there's, a, there's a, a company out there, it's called, we refer to it as Remy. They're nationally recognized. Uh, it's based out of the George Mason University. Um, and we partnered with them to you know, run some, some economic analysis, some modeling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so our results of, uh, of this bill uh, are based on basically firm size. As you can imagine by B some of what it stands for. So what did we find out? 99,000 jobs. 99,000 jobs over the next 10 years will be lost as a direct result of this $15 minimum wage bill. Now, a quarter, nearly a quarter of those 99,000 jobs will be lost in businesses with less than 20 employees. So your mom and pop shops, your neighborhood pharmacy, you know, even your, your Burger King franchisee, they're gonna be hit hard by this. Now, you know, it's, it's funny, uh, a few years ago, uh, our research center ran a, a BSIM study on the, uh, the mandatory paid leave bill. And uh, it found that, that 8,500 jobs would be lost as a result of the bill over 10 years. And we had uh, a, an advocate for mandatory paid leave uh, in the House hearing when, they, when she was uh, going over our study, trying to uh, poo-poo it. When it came to 8,500 jobs, she literally laughed at the idea and categorized it as, quote, virtually nothing. Now we're talking about 10 times that, more than 10 times 8,500 jobs. We're talking about 99,000 jobs. And you have to keep in mind, when we say 99,000 jobs, we're not talking about, you know, in 10 years, the labor force, there will be 99,000 jobs lost overall. No, 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 no. We're talking about 99,000 jobs lost because of this bill, as a direct result of this bill. So, I also encourage you, actually, this, uh, this study, uh, we have it available on our website if you want to go through it. Uh, if you're trying to fall asleep late at night, it's a, it's a great set, great set. But I want to pull out some of the highlights right here. Um, this is what we're looking at. Um, you know, when we talk about, because as I mentioned, uh, we're tying, uh, under this bill, we're tying the minimum wage to the CPI. So it's only going to go up from there. So we're looking in 10 years, we're actually looking at $16.20. We're not stopping at $15. Talking at $16.20, average about a 2% inflation. Now, you know, you might look, for instance, for 2018, and you say 968. Well, wait a minute, there's going to 1010, what's going on? It's just simply uh, since the, the minimum wage goes into effect or it raises rather mid-year, we just 
by the uh, simple miracle of division, and we just figured out, yeah, 968, yeah, do a little math there, so just in case you were looking at it being like, oh, Mike, it's supposed to be 1010. So, and we also looked at, on the right-hand side, the wage schedule for current tipped workers. Look at that, 363 to 1620 in 10 years. That is simply unsustainable for restaurant operators. That will, I mean, restaurant operators as it is, uh, operate, as, quite frankly, as most small businesses, uh, but on razor thin margins. They are very labor intensive, as my colleague from the Restaurant Association likes to say. Um, and 363 to 1620 is just, can't do it, cannot do it. So, as I mentioned before, uh, nearly a quarter of job losses, this highlighted issue right here, nearly a quarter of job losses will be at firms of less than 20 employees. So we're looking at $22,579 by 2018. 22,000 jobs, gone. So I would proffer to the proponents that laughed at 8,500 jobs, let's see what they do with 99,000 jobs. So, what can you do? As a small employer, manager, etc. what can you do? Get involved. Get involved, and that first point is so incredibly important. Numbers, 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 and more numbers. Legislators crave numbers. They love. Thank you. You know, whether you're for something, against something, if they can throw out a number, they love it. So right here in Washington County, I mean, if you look at your local legislators, um, I dare say that they, they really do have the backs of the small business community. They understand uh, what you guys do, uh, the risks you take to employ people, um, because you guys understand that you know there's perhaps nothing more important to a sense of self self worth than having a job. And the way you do that is by not putting increased mandated labor costs on small employers. You guys just can't can't handle. It. And that's another thing. If I if I can just kind of digress for a second, you know the mandatory paid leave. Is now in effect to go to fifteen dollar minimum wage. Um, you know, there's talk of uh, this restrictive scheduling bill. Uh, there are half dozen other things out there, and what a lot of folks in Annapolis don't realize is these don't happen in silos, right? They don't understand how everything overlaps, how they interact with each other. You guys do as small business owners. You get it. You look at your books every week, every month, and go. <laughs> How am I going to do this? How am I going to keep up with all these mandates? So, numbers, 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 numbers. You know, I encourage you guys to reach out to your legislators. Obviously, if you can make it to Annapolis with Paul and I, that is fantastic. That's the best thing you can do. But we also acknowledge that, you know, you guys got to run your businesses. So we get that. Legislators, some of them get it. Others will complain, oh, there are no small business owners down here. It's like, well, yeah. You guys, who's running the shop? You guys gotta run the shop, right? Because um, Lord knows if you are employing somebody like me, you don't want me running the shop because we're closing <laughs> right after lunch. Early happy hour. Um, but if you can't make it to the Apples, call and write. Call and write. You know, like when, when, when uh, legislators come home for the weekend, I know where they are and get in their ear. I'm telling you, it works. It absolutely works. You know, we had uh, last year, I had an NFIB member reach out to, uh, to a state senator from Baltimore County. That state senator read the guy's testimony on the floor about the bill and actually helped, albeit the bill still passed, it actually helped a man get an amendment on the, uh, on the mandated paid leave bill to just kind of help small business a little bit. So. Believe me, it works. Legislators will listen to you guys, particularly if you just say, if you have a personal relationship with your legislator, my God, that's even better. Um, but last but not least, join an organization, you know? Washington County Chamber of Commerce, like I said in my opening remarks, Paul does a fantastic job representing you guys. I cannot overstate that. He does a wonderful job. I do a pretty damn good job myself. Um, but no, join Washington County Chamber of Commerce, Join an organization like NFIB, look, you know, Paul and I get it. You guys gotta run your shops. 
So that's why you know you, you have you know mouthpieces like myself that necessarily aren't a pretty face, but you know we can we can talk till the cows come home, so we can carry your message uh, message to legislators. But at the very least, just get involved any way you can. Just get involved. So I always like to end with a little to be careful out there. I may not have been around when it was on, but uh, I was in the Nick and Knight generation. So as you guys go out there. Let's be careful, okay? Um, so that's all I got. Uh, any questions? I can uh, entertain them and, and see what I can do. Yeah? I'm sitting at a table, two very fine human service nonprofits. Mm -hmm. I represent another human service nonprofit. Um, has any focus been given to that and the impact that this bill will have on human service nonprofits throughout the state? Sure, sure. So, uh, nonprofits, are, they're all wrapped in. We're all in this together. Um, I will say that there, there is a funding mechanism uh, with regards to uh, DDA, uh, Development of Disabilities Administration. That doesn't cover everybody. Exactly. Um, so, with respect to, you know, a majority of nonprofits, there really isn't any acknowledge given to them at all. And no one's focusing on that? Oh no, I, believe me, uh, our, there are groups out there that are making their cases saying, look, you know, we're non-profit, non-profits. You know, we are at the mercy of you know, grants, other funding mechanisms, et cetera. You know, look guys, it's unsustainable for us as well. I did a calculation this last week that if a uh, business with 50 employees who would be subject to minimum wage were in that ballpark, uh, we're looking for, to locate somewhere along the interstate in one corridor. Um, they would see a, almost a half a million dollar a year difference two years from now in, in wages they'll have to pay between West Virginia and Maryland. We all know where they're going to go. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, I mean, you know, look at look at the surrounding states. You know, I mean, Maryland. We're we're very unique in the sense that. Pretty much, you drop a pin anywhere in our state, and within an hour, you can be across the border somewhere. Five and a half miles. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I not only do I represent NFIB in Maryland, I also represent them in Delaware, in, in Dover. And I mean, it's just, it's, it's easy. I mean, particularly, you know, for our, uh, you know, well, actually, we have a lot of seasonal uh, employers around here with, with Deep Creek Lake and whatnot. But like Ocean City, over there down on the shore, I mean, they just go up to Fenwick Island. Boom, be done with it. You know, no sales tax. Heck, why not? No mandated paid leave. No fifteen dollars minimum wage. Dirty lower. Why not? Why not? You're still going to get the Ocean City goers. They're just going to shoot up to Fenwick Island. Absolutely. But yeah. how did the Maryland legislation? When you make a, like that comment, is just like, oh my gosh, why is anybody want to come to Maryland? Why, why do they not get something that simple? I mean, I just uh, because you know. I mean, they're driving the business to the best point, right? They're sure. driving it out of here. So is that what they're, stuff they really want? I mean, the taxes and everything else is... Well, they're... Uh, I don't understand those, what they don't understand. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, believe me, I'm right there. I mean, I, 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 you know, if, if, it, it would, if it wouldn't run, it run the risk of damaging <laughs> what little, uh, what little, um, uh, you know, what, what little political clout that I had, if it didn't run the risk of, of damaging that, I'd go up there every committee hearing that I was opposing a bill and just go, guys, you got to stop. Knock it off. You have to stop. But to your point, you know, a lot of folks, um, and let's be honest, I mean, the, the, in, in Annapolis, the Montgomery County, the Prince George's, the Baltimore City delegations, they have considerable clout. Why? Because, I mean, they got more folks down there, right? And being a Montgomery County native, growing up in Silver Spring, I'm allowed to say this, but they kind of live in a different world. You know, they, they have a different way of, of viewing things. Um, and, you know, they either, you know, when I go up and I say 99,000 jobs, they think of it as hyperbole. They're like, ah, it's nonsense. Or if we talk about, you know, hey, listen, there's a little pizza shop, downtown Hagerstown, you pass this bill, it's going to cost them $65,000 a year. They go, ah, it's just anecdotal. It's just like, well, what do you guys want? You know, what, what do you need from us? 
So, you know, it's, and of course, I mean, there's, there's always politics. There's always, there's always politics. Sure. Mike, I'm just curious, just for the past, mm -hmm. it's kind of like a national trend too. True. What type of businesses, workers, are going to be hit probably the, the, the hardest in terms of losing jobs? I mean, you hear that the, the living wage is as good for people. Right, right. But for businesses across the board, it's going to probably impact them differently at certain types of businesses, whether they're just going to use automation and other things yeah. to, to eliminate jobs. So in what you do, what do you see as the type of business that's going to be hit the most with this kind of law? Well, it, the type of business is going to be the small business. You know, I, 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 it, it's funny, and again, this, I, I personally, I don't feel this is hyperbole at all. You know, there is a certain kind of legislator, the one that, you know, is a big proponent of this. It's ironic because oftentimes that legislator or that advocate uh, will deride your quote unquote big box store, your, your Walmart, your Target, and whatnot, and say, you know, they're suppressing wages on their workers and this and that. And then they say, you know, so we have to, we have to make them, you know, raise the minimum wage. We have to make them pay higher wages. And it's ironic because you, you, you look and you say, well, look guys, who do you think, you know, on the spectrum of, of businesses from small to large, who do you think is in a better position to absorb those labor costs, those big guys, who isn't? The small employers, who's gonna suffer? The small employers, they're gonna be gone. And, you know, to your other point, um, you know, what kind of worker, um, it's the one they're, they're trying to, that 570,000, you know, workers would benefit from this. Those are the people that are gonna be hurt the most, right? Because another thing, and one thing I didn't mention is the concept of wage compression, right? Which is the idea, I'm sure you guys know, but the idea that, you know, once fifteen dollars is, is in place, what am I gonna do with the with the manager or the, the employee I've had for ten years who is making seventeen dollars an hour? And now a new guy coming in is making fifteen. Well that doesn't happen in a vacuum. And and one of my remarks in my testimony was just like, look, a successful workplace demands that those, that those wages go up by a comparable amount. Because again, a successful workplace demands it, regardless of what the balance sheet is. So, you know, I mean, I, I did uh, an op-ed, uh, it was published in the MarylandReporter.com, which by the way, is a fantastic um, website for you guys to look if you wanna keep up with Annapolis and political news, MarylandReporter.com, but we, we had an op-ed published in there just talking about these unintended consequences. And that's one of them. You know, the people they're trying to help the most are the people that get hurt the most. Because look, you know, if, if I'm running a business and you know I, I got to pay fifteen dollars minimum wage, a you know, in, in the NFIBs and our priorities and problems survey, we're finding more and more that in addition to the big three, the the healthcare uh, regulations and and taxes, our members are also having difficulty finding qual a qualified workforce, right? So now I'm paying $15 minimum wage, I'm gonna be a, even more selective on who I hire. And you know, those, those teenagers, um, you know, those kids just out of, of college, not sure what they wanna do with, people like me, I still don't wanna know. I still don't know what I'm gonna do when I grow up. But, you know, I go to apply for a job, I'm gonna be, I'm, I'm gonna be on the short end of the stick. So there, there are unintended consequences and that's the case that we make day in and day out. I think there was another question in the rear. Yeah. What's the status of the bill in the houses? What's the time frame and where's the governor stand on this? Good point. Or good good question, I should say. Um, so uh, when you when you deal in crystal balls in Annapolis, it, it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty dicey proposition, particularly when they get muddier by the day. Um, if you had asked me about a month ago what the prospects of a fifteen dollar minimum wage were uh, in terms of getting to the governor's desk. I would have said, you know what, they're, they're actually better than 50-50. Um, why? Because it's 2018. And November is coming real soon. Uh, and it's an election year, right? 
So, you know, you got all these politics, you know, the advocates, the labor unions, labor groups, etc., saying, you know, look, we got to get out there, we got to help our workers, blah, 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 blah. So, thinking was like, well, you know what? And again, this is, you know, you talk about like calculus and trying to figure out, all right, you know, if, if I'm in uh, Democratic leadership, you know, I'm, I'm thinking like, all right, uh, I have to protect this guy, but I can, this guy can vote for it, and this person, you know, whatever. Um, you know, the thought was, we'll put it on the governor's desk and dare him to veto it in an election year. When a $15 minimum wage, I mean, let's be honest, it pulls really, really well. Higher wages, hell yeah, sign me up. Why not? Sure. But, you know, I mean, those polls never, ever talk about, like, well, here are the actual consequences. And, you know, Seattle, California, this is what we're seeing out there. So they're real. We're not just making them up. Um, but now, uh, now that we're, you know, this is, quote, crossover week, where, you know, any bill that one chamber plans to pass has to make it over to the other without having to go through legislative process hurdles. Um, you know, I, I'd say it's now less than 50-50. Um, you know, I, I still think there's a, a fairly good chance at the House, um, which is more progressive, if you're talking about the political, stress, political spectrum, more progressive than the Senate. Um, I think there's still a chance that they may pass it, the Senate, uh, with the understanding that the Senate's not gonna take it up, particularly the, the Senate Finance Committee where the rubber meets the road. Um, there are a couple of uh, Democratic senators who have a very tough general election ahead of them. Um, so, you know, Mike Miller, the President of the Senate, isn't going to want to walk those, those me his, his caucus members out on a plank uh, if, if he can avoid it. So, I reserve the right to change my opinion in another week. Though. Any other questions? I know um, there, there are some other bills out there, you know. Actually, it's funny, I, I mentioned restrictive scheduling. Uh, lucky for us, it actually hasn't been introduced this year, so. Good work by Paul, <laughs> killing that. So uh, he, he scared them all off, but. Um, again, you know, I, I encourage you guys, you know, if you're not members of the Washington County Chamber, sign up today. Uh, NFIB, uh, I encourage you guys to, to join our organization. Um, you know, you can just go to our website, uh, nfib.com. And uh, you know, show you how to uh, how to become a member. Um, but again, I, I want to thank Paul and the chamber for for having me up. Uh, and again, he does one hell of a job down in Annapolis. So that's all I got. Thank you, Mike. Um, I want to thank you for working on behalf of small business. And it's a great website. If you haven't been there, nfib.com. Then you can go to Find Maryland. His uh, editorial is very well written. He's got a lot of good information in there. I think I sent it out with some chamber information. Um, and so, can I share this presentation with the folks who've been here? Would yeah. You? Okay, so I'll send this, we'll send this out to you all um, today. If you're here today, we'll send it out to you. I'll make sure you get it. Um, also, thanks to After Five Productions, Antina Broadband. We're recording this, so we'll have it on our website as well if you want to see the whole thing. But again, we'll, we'll share the presentation with you, the PowerPoint. I do, you know, when I testified, um, again, I can go down there, Mike's down there. Most powerful words in person are from you as business owners. And I know everyone's busy, believe me. You go down there, you wait four or five hours, you get two minutes to testify, but it's powerful. Um, I have gotten written testimony from many of you, and that's good. So when you ask, do they know? Mike and I have to be switching when we go there. We, we have to be Respectful. I mean, they need to be respectful anyway. We can't ask the question you're asking because they don't have an answer. So the the constituents, the business owners, can ask those tough questions. What are they going to do to you? They're not already doing. It. For Mike and I to ask those questions, we jeopardize you because we have to have good good working relationships, even though we don't agree with some of these folks. So that's what you can do. Uh, you can call. You can write letters. You can email them. Um, the Maryland General Assembly is a great website to find out about legislation, how to contact legislators if you have questions, contact us, we'll get to the information you need. There are three more things that I presented and were presented in testimony that weren't talked a lot about um, otherwise. Uh, it's not just $15 minimum wage, 
is the FICA tax on top of that. So it's percentage of those dollars, those total dollars increase. And so I'm not sure the legislators get that, where they want to hear that. We talked about nonprofits. I also testified saying nonprofits lose not just because they have to pay higher wages, but who supports nonprofits typically in a small community? The private sector, the banks, the accounting firms, the small business owners, and we all have budgets. And I know there's a line item for donations and contributions, but when your profit shrinks, guess what goes away? They cannot support the nonprofits. And so I said, it's actually gonna hurt the nonprofits because private sector won't have the disposable discretionary income to give those nonprofits. I also mentioned, I uh, worked in the franchising world for a couple of years. When folks are looking to buy a franchise, retail, whether it be restaurants, hotels, any type of retail, they'll do their due diligence. And then we look in Maryland, the business model doesn't work if you look at its minimum wage. And so the franchise opportunities, the restaurants, everything you can imagine is franchisable. They'll look in West Virginia, Pennsylvania. They just won't come to Maryland. It can't work financially. So there are unintended consequences. We do need your support. The legislators do listen to you. So when I send out an email pleading for testimony, written or otherwise, I've, again, a number of you have provided that, thank you. We'll provide templates, we'll provide talking points, and just put it on your letterhead, and it means a lot, we'll get it in their hands. Um, the other thing you can do is tell the folks in the community, your fellow uh, business owners and colleagues and people you work with in the community, uh, when the uh, mandatory paid sick leave went into effect, Half the businesses didn't even know what was going on because they're busy working in their, in their shops. So if you know of something, tell your friends, tell your contacts, share the information we share with you, it helps. Because a lot of people just don't know, they're so busy and they're, uh, again, they care, but they're trying to run their business and they don't even know what's going on. I had one person tell me the mandatory paid sick leave didn't apply to him, he had fewer than 15 employees. Well, it does apply to him because you don't have to have pay it. You have to give it without pay. You have to track it every, every paycheck. So it affects all of us. Um, with that, um, we appreciate you being here. Again, if you have any questions, contact us. We'll get you to the right folks. I'll get you to Mike. And we'll get you to the people down in Annapolis. We have a very strong delegation. Um, they also want to hear from you, and, and they'll share your messages in Annapolis. There's a director in the back you need it. We'll share the presentation. Um, I wish I had better news for you. I, I do think Mike is right. I think there's a less than 50% chance that this legislation will go through this session. I promise you we'll be back next session. And if it doesn't go through this session, it'll be hard to work this summer talking to these folks, helping them understand the impact they have on our businesses and organizations. So thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Um, have a good rest of the day. We'll look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, thanks Mike. Thank you.